everybody, welcome back Hello. to Van Halen Stories number 26. Today, my guest is Harold Moore, all the way from Oregon today. Harold was in the uh, Pasadena area in the early days of Van Halen, actually way back to their childhood. And his father, he was just telling me, his father knew of Jan Van Halen. And that's kind of where your story got started. Your family came to Pasadena through the military, and then you ended up uh, getting to know the Van Halen family through your father. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. My grandmother uh, took us little tykes up to uh, Hale School, and I think that's where my grandmother first found out about the Dutch family. There was a Dutch family that lived on us on Vista Street that was uh, just a block away from uh, Van Halen's up on Las Lunas. Then after there, we moved, after second grade, we moved over to uh, the other side of Devil's Gate Dam. Uh, my dad wanted to get closer to JPL. Okay, your dad was working, you said earlier, your dad was working at JPL. He came there to work at JPL. Yeah, yeah. Then there, I uh, went to school with uh, one of the members of a headwinds band, uh, Mark Pointer. Then after we got out of military school, then that's when we really uh, started understanding what the Van Halens were doing. And uh, we moved uh, to... Uh, back to Pasadena, back to the other side. How, how old were you then? What how is what age were you back in Pasadena? It was like a sixth, seventh grade. Okay. And uh, we had a pool in the back. And right next to us, our neighbor was uh, Mr. Strutt, another uh, alto saxophonist. And we heard him over there jamming. Somehow I got involved with uh, Rody and them for a couple parties. They allowed me to move their amps around and, and set them up. Okay. And they they still stayed at Las Lunas. Even when we went to La Cunada and back, they were still there. Uh -huh. After uh, Pasadena City College, uh, I kept going, and they went off to the Strip. They were playing a couple places on the Strip. So tell me, tell me about Pas uh, Pasadena City College. Did you go to college with them there, at Pasadena City College? Uh there was a few classes that he took. I'm not sure if it was him or Roth. There were uh, concerts there, uh, Jabberwocky and uh, Mandala uh, were playing there. Saw him a lot there in the in the, the front area with the pool. Uh, but the Pasadena City College pool up yeah. front? Yeah, up front. So, so your dad, did your dad know Mr. Van Halen or not? Yeah, he went to to one of their parties, and we we heard him jamming with uh, Mister Strutt next door to us all the time. Yeah, so they would jam at his house. Yeah, but but Mister Strutt was, I think, uh, there was another. Uh, what Mister Van Halen was trying to do was work into uh, Polka Parade on the TV. I don't know if you ever heard of that Polka Parade. Yeah, Polka Parade. When we lived in La Cunada, when we moved back over on the other side of. Uh, Hillsgate Dam, a polka parade guy was our neighbor right on the other side of the street. You know, the, the guy in polka parade on TV. Okay. So this is a group like a, a that did that kind of music. TV show, TV show on TV. Okay. It was a TV show. Well, Mr. Van Halen wanted to be on that. Yeah, that's that's my theory. What makes me think that is my friend, uh, Bob Clemens, who uh, lives in uh, Kauai now out in the Hawaiian Islands, uh, his dad was a big, but he played a larger saxophone, uh, almost bass uh, sax. Okay. And so that's that's what that's what we think what was happening, and so we there was a lot of free parties that that Eddie did for us, uh, birthday parties and stuff. But his dad hurt his hand uh, there when we were in Pasadena. Yeah, out, ba out back, right by the by the garage. Yeah. Got and after it. that, that's, I think that is really where we lost, where I lost track of what they were doing. Because from then on, every party was paid at the door, specifically. They know they were working. They they had to make money. And uh, right, because their dad, he couldn't play play gigs. Yeah, I suppose that's, that's, that's the reason. So I can't say for sure where my grandmother found out about uh, the Dutch family, you know, when we were little tykes, when we first li lived in Pasadena, was that was that was it a Dutch family unusual in that area? No, there was one. 
there was one across from us. We all played together as little tykes at uh, Victory Park. Okay. The thing that Eddie, I think he didn't like was me uh, when I was walking late at night. I mean, this is like one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. When I'm walking to the parks, you know, I'd be following him. You know, he, he'd be walking, you know, at, at the Victory Park. And so he he didn't like that, me tailing after him. <laughs> <laughs> so were you, you were younger than him by a little bit? Uh, no, I was a year older. Okay. So you're 69 uh, now? I, I was born 54. Okay. Alex, 53, and uh, he was 55. My dad got tired of me mooching on some of the relatives, so I he moved me into the YMCA there next to City Hall. Okay. And every morning at 8 o'clock, I would jam uh, Captain Beyond precisely at 8 o'clock. I'd open up the windows. <laughs> I, I would jam uh, Raging River of Fear, uh, Fear right out the windows, right into the uh, police parking lot. Being Just being rebellious or what? Yeah. Yeah, I was pretty kind of kind of on the rebellious side after I, that was be the only tune that i would jam your raging river fear you know goes down up and then you know the two stereo effects and so one morning when eddie was setting up at uh out in front of city hall uh i was still sleeping and uh they were setting up and and i hear that dun -dun, and you know the hu huge uh you know guitar and I look, I stick my head out the window and I see them out there. They're setting up in front of the, the corner of uh, City Hall. So I think that was the police. You know, they were they were laughing that day, you know, shaking me out of bed. Well, everybody, the whole, I the whole block. <laughs> so did they play a gig that day there, I guess? Yeah, that was one of their first uh, times was at uh, the corner of uh, City Hall outside in the street. And they played a lot of times outside there. That was back in the day when uh, Eddie had some some amps he was fixing up. Uh, he used a, a transformer or a Variac right, on his right. amp head. He had a fan blown on it as well. And uh, boy, it really made the sound the way he wanted that was one of the first times they, they played with uh, Roth. I lived with uh, the Red Ball Jet uh, band members uh, from Red Ball Jet, the uh, drummer and the uh, guitar player. Uh, Gary Taylor got a job at the uh, Bering Grassmuck there on Colorado. Right, the music and store. I, yeah, and he we were always railing on Eddie when he came in to get strings, you know, you know, there must be a law against brutality to guitars. You know? <laughs> and, uh, because he was messing with them all the time. Is that what you mean? That was, is that what you well, mean? He was, he was so wicked on on the oh, okay. on the strings, you know, through the amps. Right. I mean, you didn't have to have uh, the distortion on. He he could make it just the way he played. <laughs> so tell me about tell, tell me if you can about Barry and Grassmuke that that store. What kind of store was it inside? Well, it started out, I think, as a piano uh, keyboard place, okay. and then uh, they moved in some PV equipment and guitars, and they, they built a little uh, sound booth, uh, glass, all gla in the corner, Okay. and uh, Gary Taylor got a job there. <clears throat> right, you said from Red Ball Jet. Yeah, from Red Ball Jet, and uh, I don't know, when I first saw Red Ball Jet, uh, Roth, kind of considered himself a flute player. He wanted to be like Ian Anderson. They play playing oh, flute. He played the flute. Yeah. And I that didn't work too well to begin with. So but anyway, uh Barry and Grassmuck, that that was kind of like the meeting place for a long time. Taylor would tell us, you know, hey, they're they're playing out down at Six Flags, Magic Mountain. And so we'd know everywhere that they were going to play so the red ball jet person he was he just was the, like the guy at the music store that knew where van halen was going to be playing right Is that yeah yeah gary taylor always had a, had a clue uh yeah. at the later days uh the earlier days the guy we went to to find out where all the part free parties were was uh alan hull okay he uh, he was a gas station attendant at the uh there on allen the corner of Allen and Villa, and he saw the whole thing. If you ever wanted to 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 talk to somebody, 
who saw all everything that went on with Van Hat would be Alan. Okay. He, he was there from the beginning, and so we always knew where the, the parties were. That little shopping area there on Allen and Villa. Right, right uh, by Los Lemnis, right? This is the place where I lost Lemnis that they put their name, Van Halen, in the concrete, right? What, two blocks from their house or so? Oh, yeah, that little shopping area. Yeah, yeah, and there, right there. Yeah. There's a, a back street into there, too. There was a laundry mat in there, too. So Barry and Grassmuck was... Uh, Kind of interesting. The the other store, uh, Sound Chamber on El Molino. Right. I was just there. I went there when I was there where it was. I went to it's right next to the Playhouse, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there there was a record store right next to it too. That, okay. That's that was... full of the records. So the, there was the I was just told uh day before yesterday by Carl Jaw from Dread Zeppelin that the, the entrance to that so the uh, sound chamber was on the side in the alley. Is that right? Yeah, there was an entrance there, but I always went to the the front entrance on El Molino. Okay, there was a front entrance. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the front entrance was there, and then further down was uh, the record shop. Right next to it or on the corner? Yeah. Uh, I, think it, I think it was, yeah, right next to it, yeah. Okay, because I was in that. There was three spaces there that I went and visited because because Tad told me where it was and it's there's he said it was the center space and the space closer to the playhouse and then the third space he didn't know what that was but that could have been I guess the record store yeah just I was just trying to document where it was since nobody nobody in, at my you know at this point in time knows where it was except you guys I was uh, kind of uh, hitchhiking around a lot uh, I remember one time. I was going down to San Diego. This is kind of the later days. Uh, Eddie got a blue van. And, oh, my God, once he got the blue van, he was everywhere. <laughs> so I'd, I'd hitchhike down to, to see my aunt down in uh, in San Diego, and there he was with his blue van. It, wow. What kind of van was it? Uh, I think it was a Dodge, possibly. What year was that, you think? Uh. 75, 76, so 76. It was earlier, earlier on. I got you. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you saw him in this van in San Diego? Yeah, in San Diego, uh, someplace close to the beach. So tell me about some of these, uh, like the parties. And well, you went to school with them, right? You went to uh, middle school with them. Is that right? Yeah, John Marshall, uh, junior high. Tell me about the school and about, about going to school with them. Yeah, he was so quick, articulated. Nobody could catch him uh, playing handball, playing about. He was, he was really apart from from all the other kids. You talking and, about uh, just regular? And, and he was good at regular sports. Oh yeah, yeah, really, really good at sports. He's quick or, and, or or what? Well, just being so hyper and quick, you know, nobody uh, could catch him. Uh, the th one thing I remember, I I, I remember Tad talk, telling you about the story. See the the lightning incident at yeah, at talk, the talk that. that was later. That was that wasn't during while we were going to school. That was a bit later. Tell me about John Marshall School and about what your impression. You said he was great at sports. What about Alex? Was he in sports too? Or I don't remember. My, the only thing I remember about Alex was his. He had a girlfriend. Uh, I was I was putting books away in my locker, and his girlfriend uh, came up and started rubbing my butt. So I was, <laughs> was kind of put off by that. <laughs> he he was in the grades above us. He was. Okay. He, I I don't remember much about Alex to tell the truth, except at uh, uh, the little tykes days when we were all little tykes. But you remember Eddie being good at sports and and of course guitar. You probably saw at, at John Marshall too, right? Because they played yeah. there. They yeah, played they there. played in the. Uh, they they play it off to the side. Just one time, I remember that. I, that's they play outside or inside. Yeah, it was outside. Uh, in Marshall, there there was a little uh, enclosed area inside all the the, the school buildings. Okay, like a quad. Uh, yeah, oak oak trees. It was really nice inside there. Yeah, those those were the days. I had had a lot of fun. Uh, Rodian in for him. Uh, I I remember his uh, Marshall cabinets uh they had covers right he, he really uh he really took care of his equipment the thing i tried to impress on tad 
was Eddie understood electronics of what was going on with his amplifier. You know, wattage, amps, resistance, and uh, voltage, those he understood. And uh, I think a lot of people, if they would just look into what they're doing, you know, with their amplifiers and stuff, mm -hmm. they would have a great, a lot better time, uh, you know, uh, setting up stuff and and knowing how to do stuff. But uh, that guy uh, Alan Hole, if you if you could ever get a hold of that guy, he's moved up here with me. He's over in Montana. So tell me about some of these parties that you saw with Van Halen, the free ones that you went to. Uh, what do you remember? Was, what do you What do you remember about his guitars that he was playing back at that point? Do you remember the particulars? Uh, they were Stratocasters. The one free party that I remember the most where everybody was there uh, was on uh, Huntington Drive. And I had walked all the way down to Huntington Drive to where the party was. This was when they were they were playing. There was a free party after, you know, his dad hurt his hand and he was already had been playing on Hollywood on the strip. Okay. And just before he hooked up with uh, Kiss guy. Yeah. And uh, the, he had a uh, he had a big giant uh, uh, lighting uh, projector. Yeah, like a spotlight. Yeah. Yeah, a spotlight projector. It was up on a tripod. He had this guy operating it. It was an old school. I mean, like super old. But they had it working. A theater one. Yeah, th yeah, and right. uh, had it work. Uh, spotlight in them. And uh, Mark Pointer was there. You know, the headwinds guy. And Eddie, I, I just remember he was partying with everybody. He and when he walked through us, like we were, we were real tight knit around the stage. When he walked through us, he was like rubbing against all of us as he's walking through us up up to the uh, stage. It's like he was like a uh, a weasel or something. He was just we. He didn't care if we were you know tight knit. He was just right. weaving right through us up up to the stage. Yeah, so this isn't a backyard party though. That they yeah, this is a free, yeah, this is a free backyard party. Somebody's uh, they got birthday. a big, big spotlight. Yeah, a big spotlight, and uh, this is when uh, Anthony had more of his Ampeg uh, cabinets, and uh, he blew up something. Uh, he had wired the speakers for more wattage, and something blew up on one of his cabinets. It was like a big mm, decrease. They they had a. Uh, Deep Purple tune, uh, where is she now? And uh, and I think that's right about where the, the amp, one of the Ampeg speakers cut out. <laughs> <laughs> so what did they do then? They just kept going? Yeah, somebody, the police, shortly after that, the police had called, and uh, they were had great, they, they had already, he had, Eddie had already turned down a lot just, just to, keep the neighbors happy but it was a huge crowd it was the whole backyard and into the uh into the uh, Hunting Huntington Drive people you know because he was well known because I guess from Hollywood on the strip the one part I remember uh you know where's Eddie come on we gotta get jamming and then he'd just be weaving through us like like we were grass you know up up to the stage <laughs> the time that he converted to uh Explorer one of the first jams at uh, the Civic Auditorium inside Mandala was playing opposite. They were the headliners. The setups were they they were like right close to the door to the entrance. Okay. So you had this huge area behind them where people could could go, and uh, they allowed alcohol and drinks. Everybody says that there were um, multiple bands, always in the exhibit hall, never in the theater. Is that right? Yeah, the, the the largest area. Yeah, yeah, it's in the in the exhibit hall, and it's like this big concrete room that everybody talks about. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the one part I remember, the one show that they got in trouble for was the uh, the one entrance when the the two uh, uh, fire uh, columns of fire uh, effects that they had. The those went up to the ceiling, and they the they were. I don't remember seeing them after that there. <laughs> into that <laughs> right yeah so, yeah so that's at the civic you're talking about yeah at the civic that was one of their last shows that that i remember seeing them they did play this one show where all the band it was like a battle of the bands all the bands were there uh jabberwocky mandala and uh the remnants of red ball jet 
uh, Gary Taylor and uh, his drummer, uh, one of the Schmidt brothers, uh, Kelly Schmidt. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a whole string of women singers. I'd say about four or five girls, pretty girls, were up there singing uh, with with these guys. So Red Ball Jet, tell me about what music they played when you saw them or, or when you're aware of them. Uh, well, well, Gary Taylor, uh, one of the original founders, uh, living with him, we got uh, one of the Echoplexes. Eddie gave uh, Gary the Echoplex, and then I got it. The, I saw Roth at the uh, hamburger place across from uh, uh, the big uh, Nazarene church up, nice. up on uh, Washington a lot, too, at the hamburger place. He, he wore these super tight uh, jeans. You know, like hot pants style, like full short. I mean, and with no shirt. All the no time, shirt. all the time, or what? Yeah, no top. Of course, of course, he had he had a lot of fur, you know, in his chest. <laughs> and, uh, right. And that's all he wore to the to the hamburger place. And I remember <laughs> talking to her. I said, "Harold, we didn't see you at Magic Mountain. Where were you?" <laughs> you didn't make Magic Mountain, huh? No. The yes. the thing back at the Civic, the one Kiss tune that they played, uh, I I'm sorry I can't remember the name of it, but the accents that Eddie put on some of the notes is better than Cru Kiss. The the way I mean, Eddie played the Kiss tunes and put some real soul into it, and it sounded better than even the the recordings that, that Kiss. Maybe that's what got Gene Simmons going. I don't know. I just remember the outside jams at uh, City Hall. He had a, uh, a style. He'd be going through stuff. I remember this was like directly in front of City Hall when they played with Headwind. Headwinds. He had. It was frightening to watch him do this. I mean, if you could look at Eddie, it was all all the scales against the nut, and he. It was every, all. It was like this incredibly complex, tremendous, and then he'd end on a on a on a uh, a note, you know, on on the low E, you know, vibrating, mm -hmm. and then he'd do it again on a different scale, uh, onto another note, you know, ending on it, and it it just it made the hairs on your back. I mean, to listen to him, it's like. He's like warning you of some the scales. Like he's going through this, and it wasn't no hammer-ons or stuff like that. If if that could ever be recorded, if somebody could make a recording of that doing that, it was frightful to watch him do that. Is this during songs or or what? No, that's when he he would he would be soloing. They all had like uh, solo spots. Uh, Sure. I like this part this part where he was doing all this scale against and, and then ended on on the the low e uh, and doing the vibrato mm -hmm. and then one key up one key up one key up oh man it just filled you with uh i i was scared you know i would i was i thought something was going to happen <laughs> watching him do this <laughs> how how loud was he oh that he was he was pretty loud after uh, they were making money, and uh, after uh, the strip, uh, they had money. They all had four by fours. I guess they ripped up the PHS uh, grass. This is a story I heard. They all, all went and bought four by fours and were ripping up the uh, the grass at the PHS. <laughs> High school. Yeah. <laughs> we're at is it near the front or somewhere. Uh. It was one of the fields, probably the football field, I, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. The, the the whole thing. Now you went to the house. You said. Now tell me about going to the house and what you remember about being in the house. Where is where his room was and all of that. Yeah, the, there was the front room area with the piano. It was very similar to the to our neighbor's house, uh, the Brock's house. Okay. Very, very quaint. Uh, uh, very small living room when you walked in yeah his bedroom was uh towards the right or where all he had his cabinets he had two small uh pa cabinets they were cube cube style and uh we we had to go through the back alley to to get in 
uh, to the driveway to load up his his equipment. Never did it uh, through the front uh, that that I can remember. Because it was easier, or because there was a door. Yeah, open? yeah, it was easier to to wheel out his his equipment back back through the back to the back alley. Now let me ask you this, Harold, about the house. Now, when I look at the house from the back, okay, yeah, there is a room on the far left side of the from the back. When you look at the house, the main door in the back is kind of centered, and then there's a room to the left. Is that the, that was his bedroom there on the left? If you're looking at it from the back, yeah, I, I remember. Remember, I remember going in after the living room, uh, and and on the right was was his his bed and all his equipment was right there. I don't know if that was his mattress or or who that was. Okay, because it could have been different times. That could have been an add-on later. That that little spot on the left side mm-hmm. of the house. He could have been in this. They could have been sharing that room for a long time. Him and his brother. Yeah, when I went over there with Tad, there were some artists uh, living there. Tad is really an incredible guitarist. He's really he's fantastic. Yeah, you know, I, I, hung out with him, I hung out with him up there at his place. Yeah, we had a good time, man. Jamming on all stuff, all that stuff. Let me ask you about the garage. You know any? You do you know anything about that garage out back? Whether they practiced in it, which I've never heard they have, and I've never. Now I've heard different things about where he painted the guitars, but people say it was all the clotheslines out back. Do you know anything about any of that? No, I I, I know they had another practice place down on Villa, directly across from the uh, from the church. And so, a little this little side street, uh, it when you walk through it next to the church, it, it points directly at their house. I mean, if you're in the middle of it, they're they're right. They're right in the middle. And after they were through having me roadie for them, they had some people that, that did stuff through the front. But when I when I was working with the, the guy in the van, uh, he was a, a friend of, of Roth. Roth, his dad wanted him to be a, a doctor, I guess. A, uh, so this, this guy really was going to medical school and was uh, being a doctor. That's the guy that... Uh, drove me around everywhere and we picked up his picked up his stuff the one time we took uh, eddie home uh to his house he he had gone out they they gave him a big bottle of tequila or, or vodka or something i remember he was sitting in the back of the van he had a riser in the back of the van uh, we asked him hey you gonna you gonna drink that and he says no i better not <laughs> I, remember, <laughs> I remember that part when we, were, when we were taking him home, where are you taking him home from? A gig? Yeah, from after uh, a gig up in uh, something ranch. So you 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 See? would uh, you would you would help them take their gear, like their 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 cabinets and all their stuff to the gig. Yeah, yeah. I just uh, the part I remember the most is all his cabinets. Uh, I don't know if his mom had sewed uh, the covers on, but they they were. I don't think they were actual uh, Marshall equipment. I think it was something he had made at a later date. He had uh, his uh, picking hand. Yeah. He had he had a silver. This is when he had long hair and he was playing with Genesis. Okay. The, one of the first bands, no 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 singers. Yeah. Right. Um, Mark Mark Stone. Sure. And uh, and uh, he had he had silver rings. It was some, uh, they were all like Viking uh, Netherlands equipment, you know, or inscriptions. Okay. He had one on his thumb, all of these, and then all of the, this section, rings. Two on each finger, these silver rings on on his uh, thumb. So his whole, his whole hand... Well, I mean, when he went like this, you did you that, you know. I told you, you better stay away. <laughs> right, but right. He, had, he had he had silver rings. I'd say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine silver rings on his hand. They they all matched. They they weren't uh, different. That goes back to what Genesis is before Mammoth, which is before Van Halen. Genesis. He was heavily into Black Sabbath. Boy, people love that. Uh, the parties blacks playing the black sabbath and uh, again he accented certain parts 
of the tune that made it sound better than Iomi. He made it sound better. Right. Well, this, you know, they became famous for their cover songs. You really got me. It was the first cover song that we heard. And, and, and everybody says it's better. Even Bray Davies said it's Ray, Ray and his brother say it's better. <laughs> yeah. The, the Linda Ronstadt tune. Uh, you're no good. You're, you're no good. Oh man. I, I love that. That's amazing. Do you remember any mammoth gigs? Do you remember that? Yeah. That's the, the one on uh, Highland park when they were okay, mammoth. That was Mammoth, okay. Yeah. I'll ask you about a couple other music stores that, that were in town, see what you can tell me. Music for Everyone, which was up in uh, Sierra Madre, I think. Is that right? Yeah, I know. I never... You were right there? Dr. No, Mu Dr. Music? I, no, there, there was another music store down closer to PCC on Colorado. Yeah. It was uh, strictly classical uh, violins, all classical type instruments. About, what about Dow Radio? Did you go in there? Oh yeah, that's that's my whole uh, being an electronic engineer. Uh, Dow Radio, C eight surplus, and uh, so the surplus the, store. Let me ask you about the surplus. Yeah, I store. saw Eddie at C C eight surplus. Yeah, I did see, see him there. You'd see him yeah. there. Yeah, okay. I saw Eddie there. C and eight you know, surplus. Because you know he's always got you know the hooks on this thing and all the the hardware that he would get. That's probably where he got it, right? Yeah, I would imagine the. Uh, the big, the big uh, bomb. I, yeah. I'm not sure where he 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 had his echoplex inside the the big giant uh, bomb it's emptied out. Do you think that and, came, uh, came from the surplus or not? I'm not sure where he got that. I'm not. I I can't say for sure. I'm sure that that was they sold stuff like that there. Yeah, they did. Maybe, yeah, he might might have been where they got the spotlight from. Uh, oh. scene, eight, scene eight surplus. Yeah, you know, I went into where Dow Radio used to be, and it's Sammy's camera now there in Pasadena. Oh, is that what's going on there? But what's funny is that I saw pictures of the inside of it, and it's pretty much the same inside still. <laughs> it's the same. Oh. Yeah, it's the same. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty I cool. Was, I was, I was, that was like my main place, uh, Radio Shack, uh, Dow Radio, and a CNA surplus. My dad would give me an allowance, and I'd go buy some electronic parts and start learn playing uh, with electronics. I was building stuff, so I knew everything before I went to PCC, Cal State LA, and the uh, the one class at uh, Caltech. I already knew everything. My dad told me, you know, about electronics. Right. So and you had. That so was like your Disneyland over there at Dow Radio. Then I'm still like that. I'm still doing soldering and and making uh audio stuff i'm making something for tad right now and i'm making him a inline volume uh control for his uh for his studio let me ask you about that the lightning incident that that i was told about a little bit you, you, you recount that story for me if you don't mind yeah that was really traumatic all the windows in the front of the building just about every single one was smashed out by, by, by right. lightning. yeah well it, hit, it struck the the pole on top of the pole, there were, there was a uh, copper ball on top. Where uh, where was this down? Where, what building was this? It was in front of uh, John Marshall High okay. School, high, junior high. Okay, so it had a copper ball on a pole in front of John Marshall. And it blew yeah, the, the flagpole. The flagpole there. It blew the windows out. Yeah, it was so loud. It, it, it The shock wave, all the front windows were blown out. And I wish I had, had when I w first went there, I could have collected that that copper ball. I mean, I picked it up; it was still warm. <laughs> wow, it was still hot. And out down to the there was a big concrete base where the pole came out, and next to the concrete base was a big giant hole that was blasted out of the ground, just blasted. I'd say three feet in diameter, uh, maybe uh, two feet deep. Was just black and the uh, the walkway going up to it. All the dirt and everything was on, was on the cement. The walk, the steps going up up to uh, John Marshall. It was an incredible blast. I didn't know lightning could could be so so wicked like that. So y'all were in class, is that right? No, no. This this happened after we we were out of school. This wasn't during. Eddie and you were there for for what? uh see i think it was six or uh 
seventh and eighth and ninth. Okay, but you were there for that day. You were you said school was out. So why were you there? Yeah, this was after school was was over with. I was uh, at my friend's house on one of the uh, the streets going to a mountain. Mountain goes is a street going up there, and we heard it. Okay, we heard it there. It was kablam. And so we started walking over there, and we see all the windows busted out. And uh, so, uh, so where was Eddie when this happened? Exactly. Oh, he he was, he was. Uh, I think that he had moved out. Uh, this is after, I think it was after his uh, first record had come out. But it is it is interesting to speculate that that lightning, you know. There was some reason for it. I mean, it is never any place, you know, all Southern California. There's no place. I mean, if you go through records where you can find anything like that that's happened, where the shockwave was big enough to blow out the entire, almost the end parts of the of the building were intact. But you could see the epicenter, all all the ones next to the flagpole were were completely obliterated all the all the glass yeah it was it was and we heard it we thought that it was some uh car uh accident or something that had happened yeah it was it wasn't uh during school school days good thing or, or <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> good thing that in bad. Yeah, if i could clear it up just one more thing sure go it's ahead. uh alex taking my lunch money no no that, <laughs> that was just a joke you know that but I, I was always leery of, of Alex. Yeah, that's that's cool that, that you got to handle his, you said you got to handle all his gear. And did you move the marshal around, the famous marshal? No, I wouldn't let us touch his head. Uh, the cabinets we we had moved, but his head and his guitar, nobody could touch that. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. So, so he carried those around. Yeah, yeah. Well, what I witnessed anyway. <laughs> I got you. I got you. So whenever you were working with him, they would just, they, he would carry those two things. Yeah. Did you ever, did you, now let me ask you this question because did you know Chris Holmes? No. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. The people like uh, Mark Stone mm -hmm. and uh, all those people, I ne never really uh, got into him very much. Like his father's accident. I knew about that. You know, I heard he had a trailer about back and it fell on his hand and he broke, took his finger off and all of that. Yeah. That, that by far, it was like no more free parties. That's it. Pay yeah, the door yeah. or go. The thing is, they never really, they never really. I mean, they they talked about this accident, but it was something that was not. I don't know if ignored is the right word, but it wasn't talked about. I, you know, obviously, tragic event. They probably didn't want to talk about it, but like you said, it probably had an effect on their psyche and what they needed to do to bring home money for the family. Yeah, I think he was getting set up to, to play with a poker parade on TV. That, that's that's why that that's our our main theory, you know. Yeah, he, that, that Jam was trying to get going on. He was he was trying to get gigs like everybody else, but he said this was a bigger deal for him. Yeah, yeah, and he he was incredible. My dad said he was incredible on 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 uh, this the stuff uh, that he did. He, he, my dad was really impressed. When the one one party you went to, he saw Jan Van Halen play. Yeah, he was he was really impressed. Wow! But he was they were all uh, World War Two people, and they all seemed to know each other. You know, uh, one guy walking down the street can pick out a World War Two veteran if you are one. I mean, they all it's that mindset. It's it permeates. Uh, through the, your, your body and everything, you know. Well, it's kind of like musicians, right? You can pick one yeah. in a crowd, right? Yeah, you, you uh, like yeah. people that are, yeah, a guitarist is saying same, same deal. Yeah, you feel you feel it when they're around. You know what you know what mm -hmm. to look for. That's how I ended up with my gigs here in town. Is a guitar player saw me in the audience and he said, "You're a guitar player, aren't you?" And he said, "You want to sit in?" And I was <laughs> like, "Yeah, I'm a guitar player. And yeah, I'll sit in." <laughs> <laughs> Started my whole my whole second career in Huntsville, Alabama, just because he recognized me as a guitar player. Did you go to Hamilton with him? No, that's that's right when we moved over to the other side of uh, Dell's Gate Dam, yes. over to La Cunada. and Dad yeah. 
we had the big giant pool over there and we lived next to uh, the polka parade uh, guy over there. Right, right. You were saying that. So how far was that from, from them? Uh, you'd have to go across the bri- a Royal Bridge to get back into Pasadena from, from La Cañada. Thanks, Harold. It was great talking to you, man. Appreciate you sharing your stories with us. Thanks so much.